welcome to this PCFA educational webinar today, sponsored by uh, BXT Acelion. Today, we're learning about low-dose brachytherapy and where it fits in in your journey. So for today's webinar, we're joined by radiation oncologist, Dr. Joseph Bucci, with over 17 years of experience in the treatment of cancer, and urologist, David, Dr. David Malouf, who has also had an extensive career in cancer treatment and management. For this webinar, they'll discuss the advancements in uh, low dose rate brachytherapy treatment and what you need to consider to feel confident in your treatment choice. So for today's session, we'll have time at the end of the presentation for some questions. So don't ask them through, uh, through the, the um, course of the webinar. But if you have a question, please pop it into that little Q and A box at the bottom of the screen and we'll endeavor to answer those in the Q and A session following the presentation. So please enjoy today's webinar and I'll hand over to David now. All right, well, thank you very much, Chris. And um, thank you everybody for joining. Um, Dr. Bucci and I are gonna spend a few minutes talking about brachytherapy and its role in the management of prostate cancer. Uh, I will start by talking about uh, the technique itself and who's suitable. And then Dr. Bucci is gonna talk about some of the results, including our results at St. George Hospital and uh, the results, the international studies. So I'm, not, I'm preaching to the converted here. We know that prostate cancer is a very common cancer. It's the most common solid organ tumor in males. We also know that it's a significant problem. It is um, the second highest um, uh, cause of death, cancer death in, in um, Australian males. We know that the incidence of prostate cancer has been increasing over the last 40, 30, 40 years. And you can, sorry, I'll go back. You can see there was a little uh, bump there with the introduction of PSA testing in the um, early 1990s, but um, it, it, the incidence is going up. But fortunately, outcomes are improving, and so mortality rates are decreasing. And what we're also seeing is that men are living longer, which is terrific. Now, that's a combination of improved um, primary treatment techniques, and it's also a uh, uh, related to some of the uh, improved treatments of uh, advanced care uh, of advanced uh, prostate cancer. So today we are talking about brachytherapy. It is a curative treatment option. It is one of the options that I and Dr. Bucci routinely to discuss when we are offering uh, curative treatment to men with localized prostate cancer. Um, it is uh, like surgery in terms of a radical prostatectomy, a treatment option, and similarly. Uh, like external beam radiotherapy, it is a very well-proven, um, established treatment for managing men with localized prostate cancer. Um, in addition to surgery, uh, external beam radiotherapy and brachytherapy, we have combination therapies. We have some novel treatments like proton therapy. We know that hormone treatment is uh, not a standalone cure for prostate cancer. Sometimes it's used in certain types of radiotherapy. Uh, and sometimes it's used to treat advanced disease. And then you've got some of the more novel treatments such as cryotherapy, HIFU, CyberKnife, NanoKnife, et cetera. But today we're going to be talking about the role of brachytherapy in the, uh, the treatment journey. So how do, we, how do we decide? Who do we offer brachytherapy to? We look at the age of the patient, we look at the stage and the grade of the tumor. We look at what concurrent medical conditions they have, comorbidities, if you like. Um, and fundamentally, the treatment options, uh, they're all going to end up with cure rates, which are approximately equivalent. If you've got a early diagnosis of a relatively well-behaved prostate cancer, you're going, to do no, you're going to do well no matter what we do to you. So I say to my patients, well, if we can't distinguish between these treatments on the basis of which is better, which is the most likely to cure the cancer, we need to look at other parameters. And those parameters are usually the side effects and the logistics of treatment. And this is where they really do vary considerably. So we can't discriminate between the treatments in terms of cancer outcomes. They're uniformly good or they're fairly equivalent. We distinguish between what are the side effects of the treatment and what you've got to do to achieve uh, that cure. So when we're talking about brachytherapy, there are a couple of variations and we're, we're going to be focusing on low dose rate brachytherapy today, but just so there's no confusion, we have what are called temporary implants and we do what's called high dose rate brachytherapy. And high dose rate brachytherapy is a temporary implant because the radiation is only um, active in the body for a few minutes at a time. And this is, um, some people might call it 
the rod treatment. Uh, essentially, we place little catheters into the prostate and we deliver radiation down those plastic tubes for a few minutes at a time as a single treatment episode. On the other hand, a permanent implant, low dose rate brachytherapy or seed brachytherapy, they all mean the same thing. It's basically what we use as a permanent implant. Once those little radioactive pellets are put inside your body, they're there forever. Uh, they obviously lose their radioactivity over time, but they're a permanent implant. They're not designed to be taken out later on. Now, brachytherapy has been around for a lot longer than people think it has. In the 1940s, a very crude technique of putting two or three pellets into the prostate via an open surgical technique, technique was used. Similarly, in the 1970s, smaller radioactive sources, but you can see there that it's not a particularly uniform distribution of the seeds and it required an operation to place those little radioactive pellets. From, from the 1990s onwards, we've had major steps forward in terms of technology, and we're now using ultrasound guided implants with computer planning techniques to give us the techniques that we're using through to the present. So when we say a modern technique, it's driven by technological advances. We use computer assisted planning uh, techniques. We use neuroisotopes. We use it uh, via a percutaneous or a transperineal approach. There's no cutting involved to do this technique. And the methods of um, imaging have improved considerably. We're using quali high quality um, ultrasounds to guide, to plan and guide our implant. And we're using what's called fluoroscopy or sort of uh, live X-ray techniques to ensure that we're putting the seeds where we want them to go. So brachytherapy is commonly used as a standalone treatment or monotherapy for low and intermediate risk prostate cancer. Now, what do we mean by risk? If you've got a small Gleason 6 or Gleason 7 tumour, you're low or you're low intermediate risk. If you've got bulky Gleason 10 or grade group 5 tumour, that tends to be high risk. So brachytherapy is a monotherapy. It's typically patients that have got low and low intermediate risk. We can use seeds as a boost for higher risk disease, higher PSAs, higher Gleason scores, um, higher levels of clinical staging. And as Dr. Vucci will talk about a little later on, we're starting to use focal brachytherapy for focal therapy for small tumours. But today we're going to fundamentally focus on the common type of brachytherapy, which is monotherapy or, or seed brachytherapy for localised prostate cancer. Now, why do we do it? Well, it's convenient for patients. Some of our patients are treated as day-only patients. Some of them are in overnight, but it's a very simple treatment, which often involves patients being back at work the next day if they're driving a computer or five to seven days off before they're starting to do more physical activity. It is certainly better at maintaining erectile function or potency compared with radical prostatectomy. Incontinence is rare. You'd, you'd be aware that stress incontinence or coughing and sneezing and using, losing urine is quite common after surgery, at least initially. Stress incontinence is nearly zero with brachytherapy. Rectal side effects are rare. It's certainly less invasive than surgery. Um, instead of having you know, uh, multiple small cuts such with the robot or one big cut of having an open prostatectomy, we use 30 to 35 tiny little pinpricks to put the seeds in, and I'll demonstrate shortly. And it's actually quite a cost-effective technique in terms of the absolute cost, but also the cost to the community in, to, in terms of people returning to work at an early stage and avoiding some of the more expensive um, um, management of uh, the side effects of other treatments. Now, unfortunately, it's not suitable for all patients. Um, it, it, there is a learning curve, and Dr. Bucci and I have been doing this now for 20 years. Um, and I, I, uh, but it's certainly not a technique which is widely available. Fortunately, um, in each state around Australia, there is going to be one or two centres who do brachytherapy and do it very well. But if you're interested in the technique, you need to reach out to your urologist or speak to your, your local cancer uh, council who'd be able to point you in the right direction. Brachytherapy does have some early but temporary urinary side effects, which we're very good at sort of managing or keeping a lid on in the short term and access to treatment. I alluded that not everybody does it and therefore not everybody offers it as a um, one of their sort of top one or two treatment options. And so if brachytherapy is not being offered to you and um, you don't think that brachytherapy has been adequately explained and that you've been considered, it's been considered as a treatment option for you, ask your, ask your surgeon to speak to a radiation doctor or again, speak to your state-based cancer council. Now, who do we treat? 
Well, like anybody, we're, like any treatment, we're really looking for people that are going to be around long enough to benefit from treatment. So if you're 90, then you're probably not going to be a candidate for brachytherapy because you're probably going to die of old age before prostate cancer gets anywhere near you. So we need to have a life expectancy of about 10 years from an overall health perspective. Um, it needs to be low stage disease, which means it's just not palpable or there's just a small nodule there, what, what surgeons and radiation oncologists would call T1 or T2B. Your PSA should be under 10. Um, your grade group should be one to three out of five or the old Gleason six and sevens. And ideally there's been no previous TURP because that does increase the, uh, the complication rates. Now, that's an interesting question. There are, there are bladder neck incisions, which are fine. There are middle lobe resections, which are fine. But if you've actually had a proper TURP at some stage in the past, then there are brachytherapy is not an ideal treatment, but your, your urological surgeon can talk to you about that. In terms of um, what are the other issues for selection, we need prostates which are not monsters. We don't want prostates which are 120 to 150 cc's. Ideally, we're looking for prostates around 60 cc's or less. If they're a little bit bigger, there are some techniques available to shrink the prostate down. But generally speaking, we're looking for small and medium sized prostates. The reason for that is the bigger the prostate, the more likely there are to be blockage symptoms as well. And what we don't want to be doing is treating people with untreated uh, bladder outlet obstruction or plumbing problems. Now, just in case you are, you do describe a slow flow as well as having prostate cancer, and just in case you are getting up a few times at night, um, we often manage those symptoms before we do the seed implant. So having some waterwork symptoms or lower urinary tract symptoms or blockage symptoms um, is not a barrier to treatment, but we do evaluate people and we do manage those blockage symptoms before we proceed with our uh, low dose rate seed implant. If you've got a trilobed prostate, if you've got a, a prostate which is three lobes instead of two, um, sometimes we will remove that uh, third lobe because it is associated with an increased risk of plumbing problems. But we do that at the same time as a volume study. So there's no extra treatments involved. And as I've mentioned, a previous TURP can be a challenge and your, your urological surgeon will work through that with you. So there are two parts to this treatment. Part one is a volume study. Everybody's prostate is a slightly different size, shape and volume. And we need to individualize, individualize or tailor the treatment to that particular prostate volume. So Dr. Bucci and I will typically do what's called a volume study where we measure up your prostate. And we do that via a clever way of doing an ultrasound. And we collect the images on the ultrasound and we recreate a three dimensional model of your prostate on the computer. And we work out the size, shape and volume of that prostate. And that tells us how many seeds we need and where the seeds need to go. So we are also starting to use MRI instead of the ultrasound or as a complementing the ultrasound. So, you know, there are, there are ongoing improvements and MRI is not just being used to help diagnose prostate cancer, but where prostate cancer has been detected, we can use those MRI images to help us plan your treatment. It is computer-based planning. And then we work out how many seeds we need and where they need to go. And interestingly, those seeds are, um, sourced from the United States. They arrive on, a, um, on an airplane within a couple of days of us needing to do the implant and they're ready to go with your name on them. So the implant itself is typically two to three weeks after the step one so that we've had time to order the seeds and they've arrived in the country. We do part two under a general anesthetic. Typically it's a day only stay or at worst an overnight stay. We put the seeds in via what's called the perineum. Now the perineum is that little bit of skin behind your scrotum in front of your backside. And most patients these days are actually having their prostate cancer diagnosed via a transperineal biopsy. So um, as you can see on the diagram, uh, we put the seeds in via needles row by row into that bit of skin behind the scrotum called the perineum. Typically we'd use between 90 and 120 seeds depending upon the individual patient's needs. This is just a little graphic showing what the seeds look like, both in their loose form um, and in the stranded form. And the reason seeds tend not to migrate is most of the seeds we use are actually linked together by a bit of dissol uh, dissolvable vicral or string. Um, the picture on the right shows Dr. Bucci's planning and he knows exactly what dose is being delivered to what part of the prostate by um, monitoring it on the computer. And that uh, fancy picture down the bottom is what we call a dose cloud. And that's telling us that um, 
there's various levels of dose being delivered to different parts of the prostate. And typically we do this in a clever way to minimize the dose to the urine tube, the urethra, but maximizing the, the dose to where the prostate cancer is located. Now, this is actually some live images, or not live images. These are pictures taken from one of the implants that we did quite some time ago. And you can see there that there are a few components. There's a shadow of the bladder in the background. There's the darker shadow, which is the catheter balloon. The, the uh, probe there that you can see is the ultrasound probe. And this is the first of the, the rows of seeds being deployed. And as the case goes on, row by row, needle by needle, we deploy the seeds. And each of those seeds has a little cloud of radiation around it. And so that uh, once all the seeds are in the right place, there is a cloud of radiation wrapped around the prostate. And that's actually what goes to work to deliver the radiotherapy to kill the cancer cells. And that's essentially what the implant looks like at the end of the procedure. You can see that there's a sort of a uniform shape of the edge of the prostate. And that's a, that's a pretty good looking implant that um, will deliver good quality dose to the entire prostate. So after the implant, we take the catheter out and you go home. We typically use a medicine called Tamsulosin or its uh, trade name is Flomaxtra for a few months after the implant to keep, um, to minimize any uh, discomfort and to minimize any troublesome urinary symptoms. We'll often have um, erection medications such as Viagra or an equivalent drug started at the early, an early opportunity to maintain erectile function. That's one of the advantages of brachytherapy is that it does tend to preserve erectile function much better than the other treatment options. Dr. Bucci and his team will do a scan either at day zero or day 30. And that's our quality assurance step to make sure that the seeds are in the right place and that the dose which is being delivered matches the intended dose. Pa patients are often back at work or back to exercise at an early opportunity. And the, the great part about this treatment is, A, it's minimally invasive, and B, you're not wandering around with pads for the first two to three months as patients often are doing after an operation. Now, what can you expect? A little bit of burning when you pass water, a little bit of blood in the urine is common. Going to the toilet more frequently during the day and during the night is common, but that's what the Tamsulosin or the Flomax is for, to keep a lid on those symptoms. You get a bit of bruising between the legs, a little bit of discomfort, but Panadol is all that's usually required. And occasionally for a, a few weeks after the procedure, you might need to open your bowels a little bit more often than usual. In the longer terms, in the longer term, the side effects are actually fairly good. Um, you might get a little bit of discomfort when you're passing water beyond the three to four month mark, but the vast majority of people, their symptoms have returned to normal by the 12 month mark. Leakage of water is exceedingly rare unless you happen to be doing it on patients that have had a TURP. And that's why we, we tend to avoid that group of patients and offer them an alternative treatment. That the risk of leakage of water goes up considerably if someone's had a proper TURP prior to their seed implant. Uh, rectal complications are very rare, blockage complications are very rare, and erectile dysfunction is actually very good. I say to patients, if you're bringing, if the erections are good before the diagnosis of the prostate cancer, the erection should be good after the diagnosis. And this is one of the areas where brachytherapy really does have runs on the board compared to other treatment modalities. The, the likelihood of erectile dysfunction and urinary loss through, with coughing and sneezing is much less. Afterwards, we see an abrupt decrease in the PSA and we see that uh, falling PSA more so in the first two to four years, but up where Dr. Bush and I have seen patients whose PSAs are still falling out towards the 10 year mark. And we're talking about PSAs which are close to zero or undetectable from the vast majority of patients. And just to try and compare complications, you know, no two patients are the same, but if you look at radical prostatectomy, there's a greater likelihood of having urinary problems and there's a greater likelihood of having erectile problems compared with brachytherapy. And to, to finish my um, part of the talk, I think brachytherapy is a very good option for many men with early prostate cancer diagnoses. I say to patients, well, why have a big operation if a simple treatment is going to solve the problem? Why pull out a big stick to fix a little problem if a little stick's going to do the same thing? And um, brachytherapy is equally likely to cure the cancer with a lower risk of um, uh, complications and side effects, which will impact upon the quality of your life. So 
I will hand over now to Dr. Joseph Bucci, who's going to talk about um, the our, uh, how radiation works and our, um, our results. And then we'll both be available at the end to, um, to answer any questions. Over to you, Joe. Thank you, David. So I'll just get my... Okay, so... Um... Thank you, everybody, for, um, for being online and listening to this presentation. So I'm just going to continue on on, the, on what David's been talking about. But I thought I'd bring more of a flavor of why we use radiation. So a lot of people wonder, how does radiation actually work? Well, often they're using very powerful x-rays uh, and a standard radiotherapy machine um, requires a bunker and that bunker often has one to two meters of concrete to stop the x-rays from getting out and the reason why we need those very powerful x-rays for external radiation treatment which is used for many cancers is the radiation actually needs to get into the middle of the body the human body and and the prostate sits right in the middle of the pelvis so hence you need this very powerful and penetrating radiation um, but we know radiation works quite effectively in killing cells. Um, and the reason it does that is by causing what we call DNA damage. So as you may be aware, the DNA in the cell is the building is essentially the, the, the blueprint for cells to replicate and tumor cells, which replicate very quickly over time are actually much more sensitive to this damage of DNA. And we get damaged uh, to DNA all the time when we're out in the sun, et cetera. Um, and we know that radiation causes damage to that DNA. The question is, how do we localize that damage to where the tumor is? So this is a stylized picture. You can see there's the DNA, which is a, a complex double helix molecule. And essentially what we want is for the radiation energy, which is depicted by that yellow line to essentially smash the DNA. And once a cell has what we call a double strand break, in other words, when you break that helix, the cell is doomed, it can't replicate and therefore it dies. So we've used this technique of DNA damage from radiation for many years using external radiation treatment. Uh, and I remember the days where we had pretty crude techniques um, this is what we called a four field box technique where we pointed the radiation machine from the left and the right and the front and the back and created a little cube of high dose or high intensity radiation to treat the prostate cancer. But as you can see, uh, you're going through the bladder, you're going through the hips and you're going through the rectum. And these are all normal structures which you really don't want to irradiate. But by using these intersecting beams, you get a very high dose at the intersection point. And um, we've used more and more complex ways of delivering external beam radiotherapy. You might hear about IMRT or VMAT. Essentially, instead of those four um, fields that I was showing on the previous slide, th the machine is actually dividing those fields up into 360 fields. In other words, a whole revolution around the patient. And as it um, rotates around the patient, it's giving a bit of radiation at every different angle. So you get these uh, very nice pictures here showing uh, less radiation uh, going through the hips and the bladder and so on. But what you do get uh, is this radiation dose wash throughout the body. So you still always get radiation in other parts of the body. It's just how you want to move it around in order to get a very high dose to the prostate. Um, and you can see that these uh, yellow areas um, are just sort of more evenly distributed. And you can see, for example, in the rectum with older techniques, you're getting less radiation to the rectum with the newer techniques, which is the VMAT technique. So this, uh, and, and a lot of technology has gone into improving this, but what we've also known is that if you give more radiation, uh, and typically we weren't able to do this in the past because of pretty poor technology. But if we gave more radiation, you actually kill more cancer cells. And if you kill more cancer cells, you actually improve the cure rate. So this is a, a, a landmark study in the past, and it's a while ago. Um, but basically, 
it shows that if you give high doses of radiation in the red curve, as opposed to standard doses, which are no longer considered standard, but you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago they were, you actually do increase the survival of patients. So you can see here that uh, on the bottom axis here, you've got time and you've got proportion of people who are, who are alive without cancer. And obviously the red curve marks a better outcome than the blue curve. And that red curve corresponds to patients who are treated to higher doses of radiation. So there has been a real race to increase the dose of radiation. But as I showed you on this previous slide, um, there's a limit to what you can do. And the other problem is the higher you go in terms of the dose of radiation, the higher the risks are to these surrounding structures. I mean, the higher you go, the, high, the, the harder it is to fall if you do have problems. And so there's been a lot of technology in trying to minimize that risk as much as possible. Now, I'm a, phys I'm, I'm a physicist at heart. Um, we're a radiation doctor uh, and, and we love physics. And this is a very simple formula, but I'm sure you're all aware of this on a practical basis. And what this means is the intensity of radiation I reduces not proportionally, but to the square of the distance away from that source. So what does this mean? It means if you've got a light source and you're one, two, three, four, five meters away, from that light source, the brightness of that light doesn't reduce proportionally, it reduces by the square of the distance. So if you move from one meter to two meters, the intensity is one quarter and so on and so forth. And you can see there that by the time you um, get far, further away, um, there's very little radiation or light um, at, at distances. Now this is important because if you've got a machine that's got to shine that radiation into a patient, you can see if the patient's two or three meters away, you need quite a lot of intensity to get it into the patient. Now, wouldn't it be great if you could actually put the radioactive source directly into the patient where you take advantage of this physical law, where you get a lot of radiation right next to the source, but very little going beyond it. And you can see here that on the top graph, this is the old VMAT tech, not old, but the VMAT external beam techniques that I was, I was telling you about with lots of this dose wash in the surrounding structures. And yet with the brachytherapy techniques, we get very intense doses within the prostate by depositing the energy of the radiation directly in the prostate using the needle technique that David described. And we've got a, two different forms. We've got the high dose rate and the seed brachytherapy. But what it allows us to do is allows a very high degree of precision uh, because if the seeds, for example, are in the prostate, if the prostate moves, the, the seeds move with the prostate, unlike when you're lying on a machine, if the prostate moves, the machine's not gonna track that generally. Uh, we can reduce the dose to the rectum, which has been a big problem with external radiation treatment in the past. We can sculpt around the urethra, which is the urinary tube that goes um, through the middle of the prostate. And we can achieve very high doses and exploit that fact that we knew about giving higher doses kills more of the cells because of that DNA damage. So I had to put this in because I, 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 it, it all gets very complex and it sounds very, um, um, uh, you know, very tantalizing to use these novel techniques, but a lot of our colleagues in the past um, have said, well, where's the evidence? Well, we, we have the evidence. So does this treatment work? And it certainly does. So what I'm going to show you here is a whole bunch of graphs. I don't want this to be too complicated, but I've divided this into different risk groups. David talked about low and intermediate and high risk cancers. And um, we stratify treatments according to how risky your cancer is. Um, and if it's a low risk cancer, we, we can just use localized treatment. If it's a high risk cancer, we often need to use extra treatment. So we might use brachytherapy and external radiation treatment. But what, they've look, what these graphs uh, are looking at is all of the published studies looking at the cure rates of different treatments. So this is like a summary of everything that's out there that's been reviewed and uh, published and comparing the outcomes from from the literature, from institution, the best institutions in the world, uh, and anybody who's really published, who's published a high quality study. So each one of those dots, triangles, sorry, 
on the graph represents the success rate of surgery. And you can see if it's a, a square, it's robotic surgery. If it's a triangle, it's uh, old style surgery, etc. Um, but the ellipse there represents what roughly the cure rate would be uh, over time for a low risk prostate cancer treated with surgery. If we look at external radiation, we've got um, a similar plot there. We can see that one of the concerns with external radiation is those, those dots seem to go down over time, uh, which represents failure of treatment. So it doesn't appear that the treatment is sustaining the effect of, 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 the, of uh, getting rid of the cancer. So people are relapsing over time. Um, if you thought that the treatment was sustained over time, you would expect those, those ellipses to be fairly flat over time. And that might represent old radiation techniques, which I, I described to you earlier, which were, were on those previous graphs. If we look at brachytherapy in low-risk cancer, um, they're quite impressive. And these are all the published studies, high-quality studies, showing results that um, are pretty flat over time. And we now have very good long-term results. In the past, we didn't have these results beyond 10 years. So this is now an established treatment, which really wasn't the case 10, 15 years ago when we first started doing this treatment, although it was very promising. And if you compare them, you can't really say that one is better than the other, uh, but certainly brachytherapy is not inferior to the other treatments. Uh, if we look at the next grade up of intermediate risk prostate cancer, so if you, for example, you had a PSA of um, 10 and a Gleason score of seven, um, then you'll notice that surgery just drops down a notch. Obviously, these are more aggressive cancers. Um, we look at external beam with or without the use of hormone treatment, similar sort of patterns. And then we look at the brachytherapy uh, with seeds and again, similar findings. Furthermore, these are results with brachytherapy uh, using some hormone treatment and also brachytherapy sorry, brachytherapy using external radiation or the high dose rate brachytherapy that I was talking about earlier, that's the temporary implant. If you compare them, once again, the brachytherapy results actually look very favorable. They're not gonna be light years ahead of the other treatments, uh, but certainly not inferior. And, and that little star there represents our results at St. George, just so you're aware. Um, if we look at the really high risk group of patients, these are patients who've got very high PSAs or more advanced disease, we can really see that surgery starts to fail. And, and probably that's because the risk of the cancer being outside of where the surgeon cut starts to increase. You know, the, the risk of lymph glands or disease in the bones or elsewhere starts to escalate. And they're the results with surgery. Each one of those dots, again, represents the results of a major study that's been published. Uh, so this summarizes all of the, the published literature. This is external radiation treatment with hormone therapy. And this is uh, brachytherapy with external radiation and hormone therapy. Uh, again, uh, with the high dose rate brachytherapy results. So there's something about the brachytherapy uh, and again, with hormones, there's something about the brachytherapy that seems to be more favorable. You can't say it's definitely better, but certainly not inferior. These are our results. Um, we've, we've treated over uh, 2000 patients now, but these are our results for the first um, 900 or so patients where we've got long-term follow-up. And we're pleased to report these are our outcomes. So excellent outcomes in the longer term, 10 years and beyond. And again, the important thing with these curves is that they don't seem to be dropping after about that five-year mark. It seems that once you get to that five or six-year mark, everything stabilizes. Whereas with some of the other treatments, you often have late relapses that go on and on over time, probably reflecting that you've inadequately treated the cancer. So do we have any other stronger evidence? Well, the strongest evidence you can have is what we call a randomized trial. You flip a coin and you give patient A either treatment A or B, in other words, brachy or no brachy, and you see what the difference is. And these have been done in clinical trials. These are the strongest types of trials that you can do. And we've known for many years that if you use external beam radiation alone versus external radiation, 
with the high dose rate brachy, the outcome is better. The cure rate seems to be get better. This has been done recently uh, and published not long ago, utilizing seed brachy therapy. And again, the exciting thing about these results is that the red arm is the brachy therapy boost arm. So these are for higher risk patients. And you can see that the curve in the red seems to flatten out after about that six, seven, eight year mark. In other words, if you're cured by that point, it's unlikely you're going to fail. Whereas with external beam radiation alone, and this is modern external radiation, it seems that you keep getting failures year on year, year on year over time. And then over time, this becomes a big difference. Now, this is important because prostate cancer generally does not kill people in one or two or three or four or five years, unlike other tumors such as brain tumors, lung cancer, et cetera, it's, which are much more aggressive. So really in prostate cancer, you've got to look at the long-term game. And this is important with newer techniques because this takes a decade or more for this data to mature and tell you whether you're on the right track. This is just comparing that original study I showed you with external radiation when we escalated our doses from 10 years ago to these brachytherapy results. So overall, what you can see is that the brachy, the two red lines, uh, the red line at the top is far better. Uh, so we're quite confident that we're doing the right thing by patients by offering them brachytherapy as long as they're in the well-selected group. So what's the future about? Well, it only gets better, I think. We've got better imaging. We've got MRI scans. We've got PET scans. We've got what we call online verification where we can identify the seeds in real time. And uh, we can adjust the deployment of seeds in real time if we, can, if we know where they are. And we've got better selection of patients. So there are genetic tests going on that might pick tumors which are more or less sensitive to radiation. So if, for example, we have a genetic marker that tells us that this tumor is going to be very resistant to radiation, well, maybe that patient is better off having a surgical approach. Now, we're not there yet. We don't have that information, but these are the things that we're looking at into the future. So in terms of better imaging, um, the PET PSMA scan has been a real game changer in the last three, four years. This is a scan that picks up the activity of prostate cancer pretty specifically. You can see here, um, this patient had biopsies and that orange area really depicted where the cancer was and, it, and the biopsies confirmed the location of that tumor. Now, wouldn't it be great if you could use that imaging to enhance your treatment? So some of the things that we're looking at in brachytherapy, and these are experimental, but obviously we have to test these things before we can say they're standard, but wouldn't it be great to put some extra seeds, for example, in this first panel where the tumor was, so you get a bit more radiation dose and not have to push the dose elsewhere in the prostate where there may not be any cancer. And one of the studies that we've got going on at St. George is what we call the hemiablative study. It's a randomized study, the strongest sort of trial that you can do. And essentially in patients who've got cancer on one side of their prostate only, and you've got to be lucky to have that obviously, but if you pick it up early, often it's on one side, can we get away with treating half the prostate as opposed to the whole prostate with the brachytherapy? And this is what we call a hemiablative brachy technique. And what we're hoping is that we can really reduce the toxicity of treatment substantially by just treating where the cancer is. And uh, you can't do this with external radiation treatment and you can't do it with surgery. You can't cut out half the prostate. And it becomes more and more difficult to do it with uh, external radiation treatment because these really become quite small volumes. And then the setup of the patient is extremely cr critical and things like just movement with breathing uh, will make that very difficult to deliver. Um, we, we are really excited about the technology, just like external radiation treatment has improved, just like the surgeon improved with their robots. We're doing a lot of research into detectors into the ultrasound probe. As we deploy the seeds, as David explained earlier, we use an ultrasound probe and an X-ray imaging machine to define where the seeds are. But we're just looking at them um, macroscopically uh, as a shadow on a, an X-ray image or an ultrasound image. Wouldn't it be good if we could have some radiation detectors 
that could actually tell us exactly where we are dropping these seeds. So the accuracy and the loca localization of our radiation has improved even further. And these are the sorts of experiments we're doing at St. George. This is an ultrasound probe. You can see this um, sort of pale um, blue blob here is meant to be where the prostate is. You can see that on the ultrasound screen, that round area looks like the prostate with the urethra in the middle of it. And what we've done is experiments where we have one of these probes, we put the seeds in, we look at where the seeds have ended up and look at whether or not we're correct in our prediction of where the seeds are by this imaging technique. So these are some fancy images, but essentially the blue and the red represent uh, two different uh, imaging systems. And when we've looked at this, the matching of this is pretty good. So what we can see is that we'll get to a point when we're doing brachytherapy, not where we just put the seeds in uh, as they've been ordered, but we can adjust intraoperatively and check the quality of the implant as we drop one seed at a time. So what are the take home messages? Look, brachytherapy is at least as effective as other curative treatment and it does work. Uh, that's a bit of a myth. Uh, quality of life, which I'm, is favorable, particularly with the urinary um, in, incontinence issue and the impotence sexual function issue. Uh, but you need to appropriately select your patients. I mean, if people really do have significant blockage of urinary flow uh, that require a TERP or other approaches, then maybe brachy is not the, rest, uh, the right treatment for you. Um, it is convenient. And I think the thing that I like best is that it's a bit of an honest approach because you've got a urologist and a radiation oncologist who both um, look after patients in a team approach. And we can both look after patients with external radiation or with surgery if we feel that, that that offers them the best treatment. And I think that's a good combination to have in your team who's looking after you. So it's safe, effective, has a favorable side effect profile, has excellent long-term cancer outcomes in comparison to other treatments. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you so much, guys. That was very informative presentation on brachytherapy as a treatment option uh, for prostate cancer. So we've got a few questions roll in. We've got a couple more coming in now. So I might start with David. A few people have asked, um, is this available in the public system as well as the private system? Um, I'll, I'll grab that one. Yes, it is. Uh, Dr. Bucci and I set up a public hospital program at St. George Hospital in Sydney uh, with state government support and state government funding back in the early 2000s. And that program has been treating between 45 and 60 patients per year for the last 20 years. Um, I'm aware that there is similar public funding for the technique in uh, Victoria, um, Adelaide, I believe, and certainly um, uh, we're happy to see patients from out of uh, New South Wales if required. Sometimes we get patients coming across from um, uh, Queensland. Sometimes we get, we get a lot of patients coming up from uh, Canberra and um, St. George Hospital is geared up for telehealth. Um, we get your pathology. We make sure it's a one, one stop shop, so to speak, so that we try and do as much of the work as we can beforehand and make sure that when you do come and see us in the clinic, we've got all the information. So yes, it's available in the public system in New South Wales at St. George Hospital. And uh, we have a very you know, well-resourced public hospital program to look after patients, both in the public and the private sector. And obviously if it's being done in the, uh, public sector, then there's zero cost to the patient, which is, which is very pleasing that we can offer the treatment to everybody. And when you're looking at going from a, for the private sector, what sort of out-of-pocket expenses are there for, for low-dose practice? It's always a little hard to answer because it depends upon fund from fund, fund to fund. The, 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 the expensive bits are covered by your health fund. The seeds themselves are usually in the seven to $8,000 range. The hospitalization expenses are covered. Um, the theatre fees are covered. It is, a, it is a technique which is funded by the private sector. And then um, occasionally, well, there are some gaps from time to time. That, that's always, you know, can be varied depending upon the patient's individual circumstances. But uh, generally speaking, the health funds pick up the bulk of the cost. So just just in terms of cost effectiveness, there's been a lot of work done overseas about the cost effectiveness effectiveness of brachytherapy so uh, it's a complex question but basically uh, brachytherapy from a health 
service perspective is actually quite efficient and, and effective because um, the the upfront cost is obviously a lot because of the seeds, but you've got obviously a smaller team. You don't have patients coming in for 39 treatments for external radiation or off for six weeks, et cetera. So when you look at all of the costs, um, you also have to bear in mind what the community cost is related to that. You know, being off work for eight weeks it might be an enormous cost for some people, particularly if they're in the pr most productive time uh, of their working life. Um, uh, so uh, that that makes a big difference. And if we compare that to external beam, again, it's quite favorable. So there's been a lot of work that's done there. And uh, what I can say is that generally brachytherapy um, is, is a cheaper alternative to um, surgery in, so, in, in some circumstances within the private sector. Generally, it is. So, uh, Joe, while you're talking, uh, I'll lead this one to you. It's a, so talking about the seeds being radioactive, once they're inserted, how, how radioactive is the patient and what would they need to do to protect their family? So that's the, the picture of the light and how quickly the radiation drops off is important because um, it is an issue, but it's not a major issue. So there's two aspects. Number one, when you put the seeds in, the type of radiation that we deliver is actually very soft. And what I mean by that, it's not the type of radiation that we have to give on the external beam side. With external beam radiotherapy, we need very powerful and penetrating radiation to get to the middle of the patient, so to speak. And that's why we need these bunkers because we need very powerful machines to generate that energy. Because we're putting the seeds directly into the tumor, the radiation's still effective, but it's not as penetrating. You don't need it to be as penetrating. So generally speaking, that's not a major risk. Now, there are some exceptions. The first thing is pregnant women and young children, we always get nervous about. Uh, and just like you don't put a baby out in a hot summer's day to get sunburnt, uh, and the reason for that is the long-term consequences of that, uh, that's why we like to avoid radiation exposure in young children uh, and pregnant women. So fortunately, not many of our men have pregnant wives. Uh, it does occur very rarely, but and we have had that happen. And that's been a, a reason why some patients have elected not to have brachytherapy because of that unknown risk. Um, the most common scenario is grandchildren. And the only proviso we have there is that kids just don't sit on your lap for a prolonged period of time. So that, that it's just close and prolonged contact. But there's no reason why grandchildren can't be around you. Uh, but if they're going to fall asleep on granddad's um, you know, lap, that's probably a no-no. And that would only be for the first three or four months after treatment. So David, um, your PSA is a good indicator of how effective the treatment can be. So what happens if that cancer comes back um, after this particular treatment? And what are the options for further treatment down the line after brachytherapy? Look, that's a, that's a really good question. And it's a question we get asked quite a lot. Brachytherapy is effectively an ablative treatment. So if we deliver our dose to the prostate, it's almost like having an operation without having an operation. There's no cancer left behind. There's no prostate left behind. So it's very, very, very rare for cancer to flare up again in the prostate because after treatment, there's no prostate left behind. It's essentially scar tissue. And so your, our local failure rate is exceedingly low, much less, if one in 200 to one in 400. So the overwhelming number of people are locally cured. Now, that's one half of the, the failure rate. The other types of failures are the distant failures. And if the prostate cancer has already jumped out of the prostate before you've had your um, treatment, um, then there's already prostate cancer cells running around the body. So whether you've had an operation or whether you've had brachytherapy, if the cancer's already metastasized, if the cancer's already broken away from the prostate, it, it might come back in the lymph nodes or the bones at some stage down the track. Now, whether you've had surgery or whether you've had radiotherapy, whether you've had brachytherapy, that risk is the same. Um, but the likelihood of it coming back in the prostate itself is exceedingly low and shouldn't really be a practical barrier to somebody to proceeding with treatment. And like any other patient, if it comes back in the bones or in the lymph nodes three, five or 10 years down the track, will you manage that 
as a, um, a systemic failure and you use medications and you use hormone treatment and you use drugs like enzalutamide or localised radiotherapy to manage that. But the distant failure rate is equivalent to surgery and the local failure rate is exceedingly low. Now, where you do have that one in 200 or one in 400 local failure rate, there are strategies. We can salvage that patient with a different type of rate brachytherapy called high dose rate brachytherapy, or in our practice, we'll offer patient surgery. And so you can have what's called a salvage radical prostatectomy, whereby a very small amount of recurrent disease is removed with an operation. Having said that, we do that once every few years because the recurrence rates are so incredibly small. Chris, what, what we have noticed, however, with the use of this new PET PSMA scan, we're starting to see with all treatments, whether it's surgery or external radiation or brachy, we're starting to pick up these, what we call early failures. So we, we're seeing more commonly now patients who've had their curative therapy, whatever it may be, and then three, four, five years later, their PSA starts creeping up. And we're now doing this PET scan. And what we find is that there's a lymph gland within the pelvis that was never treated that has harbored some cancer cells there and, and they've relapsed. One of the things that I think is uh, advantageous for Bracky is that when you put the seeds in there, you have a permanent record in the patient of exactly where the radiation went. And so we've got a small group of patients who have failed in that way um, that we can go back and basically treat the pelvis but subtract out where the previous radiation was and we can do that easily because we the seeds mark out exactly where the previous radiation went so you know uh, failure after treatment is uncommon because we saw those very high cure rates but with the newer imagings we're starting to pick them up a lot earlier where we can have um, some sensible salvage options just a, we've probably got time for one more question. Um, and I guess this one might be um, uh, sort of related to the, the popularity of brachytherapy as a treatment. You know, we, when you look back in the early 2000s, we we're doing a lot of brachytherapy and then we're not doing as much now. Could you comment on sort of the progression of, of other technologies that have come around putting brachytherapy back? Either Look, we're, we're so, still yeah. we're still treating go, uh, we're still treating close to the same number of people that we've been treating from the beginning. Um, in our, as I said to you, in our public program, we're doing forty-five to sixty patients per year, and we always hit that number pretty consistently. And in our in our private practice, we're seeing numbers comparable to what they were before the advent of robotic surgery. Um, they are. Their treatments, if, you, if someone's having a robotic radical prostatectomy, they're probably suitable for brachytherapy as well. It comes down to access and it comes down to whether the surgeon's actually offering that as a, an alternative treatment option. So in my practice, you know, um, I'll offer external beam radiotherapy, radical prostatectomy and low-dose rate brachytherapy to the appropriate patient. So I think what's happened is that the, the, there, the number of people doing low-dose rate brachytherapy across the, the number of people doing one or two cases a year has disappeared. We're in major centres such as Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide. Um, people are still doing in the same numbers, but they're gravitating to the centres of high volume and where the results are very good. And the sort of the, the, the number of people casually doing brachytherapy a few cases a year has decreased. But our numbers are pretty good and our numbers are good because we've, we've got excellent long-term results that we're happy to stand behind. So I think um, it, it's, it's a crowded field as, you, as patients are aware. There are a lot of treatment options available now. And I always go back to the fundamentals. Um, first thing you wanna know is that the treatment works. And unfortunately in prostate cancer, you do need 10 to 20 years to know that the long-term outcomes of a new treatment is, is um, is stable. Um, and although we have some newer treatment options in external beam radiation, for example, uh, such as stereotactic treatments, I'm not convinced at this point that we have the long, long-term data like we do with brachytherapy. And essentially they're trying to replicate what brachytherapy has done. In other words, give a higher dose to a, a more localized area. The problem is you still got to get the radiation into the patient from the outside in. 
um, and you can slice and dice as much as you like. But essentially, um, the physics of brachytherapy is always more advantageous uh, from that point of view. And whether or not external beam techniques, um, such as stereotactic treatment, are going to cut the test of time, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But we, we're going to have to wait another five to 10 years, I think, before we know that at this point. Excellent. So that's that's pretty much brought us to time. So um, the, I will pop a slide up as David just mentioned before, and and those links will also go out in a registration uh, email following this event as well, which is some patient material and some links to some papers uh, for some further research on this particular product for you guys. So uh, thank you very much to Dr. Bucci and Dr. Malou for imparting some great knowledge today. It's really good to hear, um, you know the. The, the ins and outs of low dose brachytherapy and, and whether it's an option that does fit in your journey of prostate cancer. So hopefully you've been able to take something away from today's session. It is always amazing to see those advancements um, in, in uh, imaging, helping to lead the way for individual targeted therapy, as you say. And uh, you can find more information, um, as I say, through that email that I'll send out following this event as well as um, on the PCFA website, or you can give the team a call uh, at PCFA on 1-800-22-0099. And I'd also like to thank today's sponsor, um, BXT Acelion, for helping to bring us this webinar to you guys today um, on a really important topic. So till next time, stay safe, and thanks for uh, tuning in today. <laughs>